Okay. We're just waiting for a couple more minutes. Um, are my guest panelists here? Yep, I'm here. Great. Where is, where are the pictures? Okay, here it is. Um, are everyone's, I don't, I'm not sure how we look like our people on the video. Um, Nadia's sound is mute still. All good. Okay. I can't seem to see people's faces, so it's not on yet. Oh, here it is. Gallery view. Okay, great. Okay, I think we'll start in about 30 seconds. Do we have people streaming into the Facebook, Dennis? Do you know? Yeah, I will also share in Greenpeace Malaysia Facebook. Okay. All right. Um, I'm just gonna. I just, I'm just gonna start. Uh, I think we've got people coming into the Facebook live stream already, so we're just keen on starting because we have a very interesting and exciting uh, session for you all today. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to Chiras webinar series. Let's clear the air. For those of you not familiar with the Malay language, Chira means bright. Um, a bit about Chura, we were formed in 2015 at the back of a really, really bad hay season, you guys might remember it, affecting Malaysia and other countries in Southeast Asia. And as you would know now, last year, 2019, was the worst hay season on record. We are a bunch of civilians who gather together and we want to be a voice of reason to stop seasonal haze in this region. Our members influence policy and legislation at the government level, we create awareness and education. Uh, we provide informed opinion and expertise uh, for strategic initiatives and business improvements. And we join forces with other anti-haze crusaders to maximize efficiency and boost traction for action. Uh, hi everyone, I hope you more people are joining us today. My name is Naja and I am an environmental engineer from Australia. I've been an active member with Chira since 2018. Now, the way that this webinar is going to be held is that I will open up questions to our panelists, um, and then I will take a few questions from our audience as we go along. So please put your questions in the comments section of this live stream at any time. Thanks, guys. In today's webinar, we are looking at who are out there taking real action on haze. Um, so we watch the news and how the government responds every time the haze comes along. We put our names and petitions. We, you know, do click petitions, uh, keyboard warriors and things like that. We hear our environment ministers talk about legislation, but what do we actually know? Um, who are the real heroes that keep our governments honest? From grassroots campaigners to international exposés, what is happening in activism around us? So, of course, as you already know about the haze issue, there are so many dimensions in tackling the long-term solutions. So if your questions do not relate to today's topic, we promise we will take uh, those questions and do our best to gather these for future discussions. 
So without further ado, with us today are two esteemed guests who know what's going on. Nadia. Uh, Nadia is a co-founder of Klima Action Malaysia, which uh, in short, KAMI, a youth-led climate action group. KAMI advocates for community empowerment to mobilize civil society action for climate justice. And Heng, Heng is a Greenpeace Malaysia campaigner. Greenpeace is a non-governmental environmental uh, organization with offices in over 55 countries and an international coordinating body in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Greenpeace uses nonviolent creative action to pave the way towards a greener, more peaceful world and to confront the systems that threaten our environment and promote solutions for a green and peaceful future. So Nadia and Hang, are we here? Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Nadia. Yeah. Great. Is Nadia there? Yep, yeah, great. Nadia, can I ask you the first question? Um, good, uh, good morning to you guys in Malaysia. You are the co-founder of Kami, and you and your members are fighting for just climate policies by the Malaysian government and want to ensure the urgency for action hasn't left the building. Tell, tell us, tell our audience, how does slash and burn practices relate to climate change? Okay. Um, first of all, um, slash and burn, this Sweden cultivation, what it's called, is um, traditionally, it has been used by uh, indigenous people, uh, not only in Malaysia, not only in this region, but everywhere around the world where um, indigenous people still hold uh, uh, land management practices in their customary lands. So um, traditionally, they are accustomed to burning techniques that are environmental friendly, that have been adapted to local natural conditions um, so that it does not cause a widespread impacts of forests and land fires. And, um, but what, what has been, what, what we have been seeing in this region particularly is, is quite different than that. Uh, because uh, I'm gonna pick one region because this region is still quite huge and each uh, particular uh, area have different kind of stresses. I'm just going to choose uh, somewhere in um, Kalimantan or Kalimantan Tengah, Kalteng. So in this region, um, it, 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 it used to be, uh, um, this, this region is the, is the uh, original place of the Dayak people. They, they live here for centuries. And um, what happened was that um, they, um, I think in the in the 1990s uh, there was an, a big expansion uh, during the Suharto era. Um, so the uh, big uh, economical uh, expansion. So they decided to uh, tackle on the food security issue. So they found a place, um, a, a large, um, I can't remember, around 1.3 million hectares in Kalimantan Tengah to be cultivated to be. Um, uh, converted into from forest swamp peat forest into um, a, a mega rice um, area is it's called a mega rice project in the 90s so this project is not very well informed uh, many scientists has um, you know uh, uh, has, has has written uh, the, the the Indonesian government has advised to not go through it but it was a Suharto era so it's a quite different kind of a situation back then with the dictatorship so to speak and um, this project was uh, implemented in an area where uh, peat is is quite a, a dominant feature of the landscape so um, what they did in the beginning is the they uh, they uh, they cleared the land, they, they slash and they, they cut down the trees and then some parts of it were burned and these are the kind of uh, activities that were done also in Java Island. So basically the idea was that to bring in the, the, um, the, the management or, or land practices from Java, from the, from the Sumatra Islands to Kalimantan, which is not uh, feasible at all because they have different kind of um, you know different kind of soils different kind of you know environmental um, ecological uh, functions so what happened was that um, these places were completely some of them were burned and um, 
and the first thing is this they are this thing called primary uh, emissions where the the uh the the emissions comes from the the burning part and then comes the um the the secondary emission which is the peat that has been drained had, has been drained to to cultivate the land uh, it goes under oxidation um hydro hydrophobic hydrophobization uh, and compaction. And then um, this kind of carbon that is stored in this uh, peat is completely released through this kind of um, um, activities, this kind of uh, processes yeah. I mentioned before. And then after that, the, uh, the, the peat dome, they will collapse and it creates subsidence. So I think over here, you can kind of see it. Uh, when you go to different kind of uh, plantations perhaps uh, when you go and drive and then suddenly you drive and it's not it's uh, you just like kind of dive down a bit and then the the road is not completely straight um, Sub subsidence it's, yeah it's not completely leveled so um, this is the, the the actions of the secondary emission where carbon is being uh, oxidized and and goes up uh, uh, emitted into the atmosphere so a lot of uh, people actually thought that this is not a climate issue. I, I'm, I'm very much surprised. Uh, I've, I've been talking to quite a few NGOs who don't agree that climate issues should include um, the, the transboundary haze issue. I, I, I'm quite surprised because um, if we want to compare it with, um, you know, a fossil fuel uh, kind of emission, this is the same thing, you know, um, yeah. this processes emit, uh, emits uh, emission uh, a CO2, a carbon into the atmosphere in in um, in, in gigatons. For example, the the peat, uh, the the mega rice project, which was a failed project in the 90s, has caused the the 1999 um, 1998 haze, uh, which which was one of the worst in in Southeast Asia at that point. So the project was cancelled because they do not even managed to cultivate even rice so imagine this around two around one point something million hectares was completely um uh, converted into um, I, mean, I mean the peat was completely drained and um it now it became like a a dry peat which is really easily combustible so this place kalimantan tengah has been emitting carbon since uh, for the past 20 years or so and uh, right now if i'm not mistaken the numbers are uh, around 1 million uh, tons of uh, carbon is already being emitted um, from this region alone and it keeps continuing uh, uh, the emission keeps um, you know it, it's still em emitting carbon particularly because the oxidation is still happening and the the, the area is not um, um, it's not remediated and yeah and uh, the worst wow. thing is that Yes, and the worst thing is that this area uh, not only is not uh, it has not been rehabilitated or remediated. Now there comes a new another project which they uh, they will rehash the mega rice project in the same area. Imagine this is where the the um, the region has failed to do so in the past, and what makes them think they can do it properly this time, given the current situation with the COVID nineteen, they do not have enough funds to do this. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, and we, we are probably seeing another um, another remake of the tragedy that happens 20 years ago, and this time it's going to be uh, larger. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for that, Nadia. So uh, my understanding is, and that is absolutely interesting for our viewers to understand, is that when they think about um, haze, they don't think about the land rights issues, they don't think about the practices that originated many, 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 many years ago, even before you were born, probably, you know, and the difficult, um, the complexities of actually land management in the first place. So, I mean, you know, who would have thunk that, you know, someone can decide, let's just grow rice somewhere here or grow palm here on peat land, by the way. And I think most of our viewers would already know that peat is gumboot. In, in, in Malay is gambut and also in Indonesian is gambut and they are one of the most highest um, CO2 reserves in the world. So when you start draining these peatlands out of water because they need water um, and then completely lower the water table of a certain area then all sorts of disasters happen and then especially as they have so much carbon stored 
the the minute you start burning, uh, it will keep on burning for a long time. So thank you so much for that perspective. And if you guys don't know anything about the history of how this started, um, I'm sure you, they know they know now. So thank you, Nadia. I appreciate that. Um, so, but but the the key message from here is that slash and burn practices have been going around for a long time from from traditional owners of the land, and this happens here in Australia too, where I am now. Um, but they were done sustainably because they were done with a certain amount of science. Now, when we try to modernize this practice um, and greed is involved, I think it can go horribly wrong. So I'll move on to Hang for the next question. Uh, Greenpeace has been present in Southeast Asia since the year 2000, if I'm not mistaken. Over those years, um, you guys have been very persistent with naming and shaming pulp and paper and palm oil companies that have been found guilty of repeated fires on massive areas of land. For example, Greenpeace Indonesia recently reported that 10, 10 palm oil companies with the largest areas of burned land between 2015 and 2018 have received no serious civil or administrative functions, sorry, sanctions, and dare I say their license have also not been revoked. How does name and shame work to provide traction for action, Heng? Okay, uh, thanks, Nadia. Okay, first of all, uh, name and shame is an effective way because uh, we put the company or businesses under the spotlight so that people can pressure them to reforms. And like re re uh, relying Indonesian's government is one of the tactics to pressure company to reform. If uh, local authorities such as Indonesian government are not taking enough actions, we can still focus in, uh, uh, into other aspects such as a global trading system and consumer advocacy to put pressure on these governments and corporations. This is because uh, palm oil or pulp and paper are the global commodity and the EU is the top three markets after China and India. Given the uh, EU standards for more sustainable product, there's something that Asian countries like Indonesia and uh, Malaysia cannot ignore because uh, especially uh, Indonesia and Malaysia are the biggest uh, palm oil exporter in the world. Sometimes it's not about the governments, but also the people who are pressuring the government. So uh, this should be seen as a response, not just EU countries imposing their belief on Asian countries. But that also means that there need to be a similar actions can be done here, which is consumer driven pressure for ethical products that movement um, is still slow in Asia, but that will come in the time when this become uh, important, which is uh, people power translates into purchasing power. For business sectors, the next winner are the ones who are the most uh, responsive, the most adaptive to the markets and able to uh, prove not hiding in, in uh, supply chains by being transparent and not hiding behind the paper or certifications. Hopefully one day, mm -hmm. Um, responsible company beca uh, becomes the norms and we don't even have to talk about it because all the oil that we buy will be free from deforestation and human rights violations. So uh, another key point I want to highlight is uh, this is a problem in supply chain. Uh, so to solve this, we need global efforts, not just government, but also the palm oil trader, global household consumer brand and financial institutions. Uh, I take one example. In February 2017, uh, it, like the global banker, HSBC has a funding policy. Uh, HSBC used to fund forest destruction in Southeast Asia. And because of the campaign by many environmental groups, now in uh, February 2017, HSBC have a fun, uh, palm oil funding policy, meaning that they will stop funding company or stop provide loan to the company that are destroying rainforests. But this is not enough. We need more people to do more. Wow, that's crazy. Thank you, Hank, for that perspective. Um, and I really am taken aback by the, 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 the bit that you're saying about consumer driven pressure is very, very important because, you know, it's kind of like a, a bottom up where governments kind of set policies, but then in the middle, there's businesses that all truly fund these sort of companies. And then from the down, um, sorry, top down, and then from the bottom up, there's consumers actually asking for responsible companies to do better. Yes. Um, so it, it is a it is a complex issue though because the thing is like for consumers to actually understand what they they're looking for they also have to be informed and this is where I want to kind of go back to Nadia because it's a complex issue like 
you know, there's only so much you can brain about the complexities of how you can take action. So I want to know, um, Nadia, Kami is advocating for citizens assembly. And you guys talk a lot about citizens assembly that mirrors democratic way of influencing decision making and climate issues. In September last year, I was there during the worst haze Malaysia has experienced on record. You guys with Amnesty International staged the Malaysian climate strike as part of the global movement to raise the bar on awareness and climate action. Why are citizens assemblies important and how would this type of problem solving look like? So power to the people, let us know how, how you guys do it. So um, basically, um, one of the, the solution that we think is really vital in this region is democracy, definitely. Um, citizen okay. assembly um, principle is, is uh, definitely uh, laid upon the, the principles of democracy. Um, environmental, um, uh, environmental democracy is still very low in Malaysia. When I speak about environmental democracy, I mean like um, the rights to information are Malaysians, uh, do we get uh, the proper kind of information uh, from the government? Are these data transparent? Um, you know, and, and um, could we use this data to bring more accountability to governments and also our corporations? And for that part, we are still very low in that sense. But when we think about uh, the other um, the, the other side uh, of, of environmental democracy, which is um, the point where citizens themselves can use spaces that is being uh, um, uh, provided by the government in terms of complaints and 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 um, you know uh, engaging with with the uh, with the other stakeholders we are still very much lacking in that sense as well so what we thought right at the beginning uh, in, in Kami's inception we thought that this spaces should definitely be amplified and not only uh, spaces should be amplified it should um, the, the the citizens should be informed about uh, the kind of information that is uh, out there and um, definitely um, this kind of uh, citizen assembly is still I would say um, it will not work as um, as what we have seen happened uh, in, in different uh, um, developed countries obviously because the um, climate uh, awareness is still very low and um, I think, but then I think it's really important to have uh, some sort of like a, a build up to this a political will for action because, um, you know, as empowered citizens, we, we talk with neighbors, uh, friends, local officials and how climate action could help ensure a healthy future while uh, strengthening the, the economy. And, um, and it also gives you a sense that um, this is a very inclusive kind of decision making uh, deliberation so to speak we have different kind of people um, you know um, working in this um, sort of um, I can't really say it's, it's a, a citizen assembly as a whole yet because it's very much still in its uh, inception we're still providing the, the platforms etc so our, our the people has been that has been working with us are, are quite uh, they come from different kind of um, uh, uh, se sectors uh, different kind they have different kind of backgrounds and and it also uh, comes back to the principle that kami was built upon which is climate justice which is um, uh, climate issues are not necessarily only environmental issues but it goes deeper than that it goes into the socio-economic uh, uh, um, human rights aspects as well so i think um it's really important for us to um how do i say uh materialize this this kind of uh, um, uh principle that is to uh, create more diversity in 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 in, 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 in voicing out our opinion and not only not only in environmental issues but also in different kind of aspects i mean here in malaysia diversity when i talk about diversity um i, I think from my perspective uh, it has always been from the gender perspective and also the narrative from the people outside uh, klang valley because i have to say the klang valley bubble is is 
uh, it's quite huge and sometimes we speak in, in different kind of language which the other people from around Malaysia do not understand. So this kind of assemblies, will, will, uh, it, it, it's kind of a deliberation where we give out information to different kind of groups and then these groups will, will um, come down and they will sit together and discuss on what kind of uh, solutions we can uh, recommend the, the, the parliamentarians or the, the people, the authority in power to take uh, in regards to um, you know, any kind of uh, um, initiatives to, to curb or, or to lower down uh, the, the climate impacts that we have uh, in the future or even right now itself. So I think um, you know citizens assemblies are um, inherently is, is very much ingrained to you know the the democratic principles which in Malaysia which is still um, very much questionable but we should have at least you know the the ideals of of uh, solving this together yeah I mean the suara daripada rakyat that is what we wanted right it's yeah it's it's very basic really <laughs> yeah. No, no, that's absolutely great. So, be, I, I, you know, I take your point because it's been said that the climate crisis activist movement in Malaysia is very elitist, you know, because they are urban centric and usually conducted in English. So we're talking English right now. But Malaysia, is, as you said, is a diverse, uh, diverse uh, community. You know, we, we come from different all sorts of walks of life. So how does Kami then break down the complexities of your mission to Malaysians, for example, in the kampongs, in the outer suburbs, um, of different comprehensions of this issue. What does that actually citizens' assembly look like? So basically, um, we still couldn't really imagine how it will look like because I don't want to take the the, the kind of models that has been used from outside Malaysia and you know kind of just take it in and do not you know incorporate any local. Yeah, local input. So uh, we, we're still like, this is like the heuristic kind of experience for us as well. Uh, you know, experimenting and failing, experimenting again. So uh, what we are practically doing right now is educating the masses. And we're doing this in, in um, mainly our uh, main uh, medium is English. Uh, no, in Bahasa Melayu, sorry, <laughs> in Bahasa Melayu, because um, partly um, it's a language that is understood by the people outside uh, Klang Valley, and uh, I'm not saying that uh, there is a lack of, um, uh, okay, uh, actually I am saying there is a lack of uh, understanding, uh, partly because uh, they, they do not understand the language and most of the information that is being handed down is being disseminated by um, you know, organizations, uh, CSOs, and even government is in English. So, um, um, rightly so, doing in Bahasa Melayu will, will um, connect us, you know, create, uh, help us to build relationships with the people uh, outside the Klang Valley. I think that is the, the, the most important thing to build relationship and to build trust to these people because we can't just come in to a kampung, let's say a kampung orang asli and just suddenly talk about climate issues. It doesn't make sense, you know. It, it takes a long time to get to know these communities and that's why I do not think Kami is must be the only, this is not uh, only, how do I say, uh, our, uh, it cannot be done just by us, you know, it has to be done by everyone. So part of the, the plan, the initial plan was that to get close to different kind of organizations like CSOs, um, you know, that is working uh, with these communities itself. So they already have, um, so they already have the kind of, um, so, so they already have that kind of structure uh, with the community itself. So rather than us trying to communicate with the community, why don't we communicate with the NGOs who's already working on the ground? So they will bring in the, the climate, they will incorporate the climate agenda in the strategy to empower the, 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 the rural citizens, the indigenous uh, communities. So that is, I think, would, would work faster than, you know, trying to do it all by ourselves. And that is what also, I mean by inclusivity, diversity, and this can be done in, in you know, um, assemblies where we had different kind of uh, CSOs, you know, um, you know, um, sharing what they know about this. And then we try to, you know, um, elevate their understanding in, in climate, the issues of climate, what's been happening in Malaysia. Yeah. That's 
That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Nadia. I think you, you put that really, 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 really accurately and def most definitively. And I think, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of Malaysians know this is actually a hindrance maybe perhaps to elevating that sort of awareness uh, in all facets of society because we are so diverse, because we need to include a lot of people. Um, otherwise, all these decisions are made by, you know, certain um, facets of society that don't speak for others, you know? Um, and this is where maybe people like Greenpeace comes in because I guess, um, for example, you know, the complexities, I mean, you can talk about, you know, the, the three or four sort of stage process in terms of you've got land management, you've got traditional practices, you've got owners, you've got indigenous issues. Um, and then you've got obviously uh, surely non-democratic way of actually managing land. And then you've got the fire burning and the season, but then at the other end, because this has been put up to you by your governments, then um, you kind of have to make ends meet and then kind of like, you know, use your land somehow, you know, with the best of what you've got. So this is where maybe I would be interested in Heng's perspective. Um, on July 1st, only early this year, Reuters reported that the central Kalimantan province in Indonesia um, had declared a state of emergency up until July, uh, up to September end of September this year, after identifying about 700 fires, the same fires that erupted last year, causing the worst hay season on record. Is there any way, Hank, that we can stop, put a stop to clearing uh, land by burning? Or are we going to see burning happening, but just, I guess, uh, more monitoring, more compliance, um, in terms of engagement in the ground, say that was what Nadia was saying in terms of NGOs and civil society organizations, CSOs working in the on the ground to kind of have you know transcribe some of the expectations that we see from up here to what's what's happening on the ground. So can we put a stop to clearing land by burning or what are our options here? Okay, yeah, there are three uh, final solutions. The first one, the final solutions uh, is peatland protections like Mamuli Gandana Gambuts. So the governments, uh, especially Malaysian and Indonesian go uh, the governments, they need to restore and uh, reflect the peatlands well, by, uh, by protecting the existing uh, rain rainforest and peat forest, and also uh, reflect, reflect, rewet the peatland that have been degraded. The second one, uh, what company need to do? Um, company must uh, stop peatland, of course, stop peatland clearance and start restoring the uh, forest. And, demand, and most importantly, demand the same uh, to their supplier by enforcing NDPE, which is known as a no peak, right. no deforestation, no exploitations policy. Uh, all these com companies, they have an NDPE policy already, but they are not enforced. So we need to monitor them to and also make sure they walk the talk. The last one is the ASEAN regions. What ASEAN government need to work together? Uh, they have to reform the forestry and also the plantation sector. We, uh, like when the haze is back, we shouldn't just pointing finger to Indonesians or Indonesian governments. It need uh, everyone's efforts. And this also come up, uh, uh, I would take one example. Uh, like for example, like in last year, Malaysian government just uh, managed to uh, allow ISPO to publish the concession map. This is the only part that deserves a nod is the, uh, the, for the Malaysian governments uh, because they have lifting its uh, de facto uh, uh, prohibitions on publications of this uh, concessions map. This is a good thing. And meanwhile, in Indonesia, the Indonesia's highest uh, legal authority, uh, the Supreme Court uh, in 2017, uh, they rules that the oil palm plantations concessions data is public uh, information. Therefore, the ISPO should also go ahead and publish a complete set of Indonesian uh, the maps immediately. This is the thing that we need to follow up. Okay, that's great. And can you just explain to us, Hang RSPO? Oh yeah, RSPO is the uh, global, the biggest uh, certifications, uh, palm oil uh, certifications body. And because uh, from our finding, we also found that some of the founder of RSPO also violated the, uh, before the, their policy because uh, this is a voluntarily scam, uh, the scheme. Uh, so we need, we, we cannot just, we cannot ask people to, to, I mean, to quit from ice build. Instead, we need to fix the system. We need to ask more people to support the system and improve the system. For example, Greenpeace and other environmental NGO, uh, uh, together with other uh, progressive palm oil trader, 
uh, like uh, setting up another system called the uh, charter called Palmo Innovation Group. This is to uh, fix the system, the, some of the loophole in RSPOs. Okay. Thank you, Hang. I really appreciate it. But it sounds like in the meantime, um, we probably will be clearing land by burning. So what is the update on some of these hotspots that we see in central Kalimantan? Is it still burning? Yeah, uh, if, if you refer to the news uh, recently, there are still lots of burning. The, the main challenge mm -hmm. is, uh, I mean, it's the same, uh, is the, the uh, transparency, is the concessions map. That is why the Indonesian government, they have to, uh, because they have uh, they put it as a public information really. So RSPO should go ahead. They should publish the complete sets of Indonesians map immediately. Because uh, while, uh, it's, while getting the progress to get some map published, we also found that uh, some of the data cruci uh, crucially does not uh, include RSPO members, uh, third party supplier, which make up much of the productions. It's, uh, this, uh, I think it's, uh, it's too little because it doesn't include the com complete data. And because the definitions, the ISPO definitions of group ownerships is uh, not sufficient and also poorly implemented. Um, one more thing is also uh, it's too little because the data isn't downloadable as uh, we call the uh, shape file formats or other jaw data format permitting analysis. This is the thing that yeah. we need to uh, follow up. Okay, that's great. Thank you. So, I mean, that's clarified a lot of uh, questions from possibly something that our viewers don't know. So, my understanding is that uh, you're absolutely right. So, you have, you know, big companies, only a few companies that are multinationals that actually have plantations in both Indonesia and Malaysia. And whenever sort of small fires happen, they say it's not our land, but then um, it's not our concession. But then actually, uh, just because it's, it's, I mean, they're getting away with technicality, really, because, you know, as you said before, you don't have um, your third party suppliers in terms of your supply chain mapped out in terms of ownership. And so uh, time and time again, these people are, are getting away with, you know, perhaps illegal or, you know, unsustainable practices. Um, and it's high time that RSPO as actually an independent organization um, tackle this issue. So that goes into my next question for you, Heng. Um, the ASEAN Agreement on Transboundary Haze Pollution, which was actually signed by all members of ASEAN in 2002, but only just recently ratified by Indonesia, calls for haze to be mitigated through concerted national efforts and intensified regional and international cooperation in the context of sustainable development. So, this is to be done through monitoring and prevention activities mostly. That's what they're um, pretty much focused on. Um, what about prosecution? Will we ever see? <laughs> this is something on our viewers' minds. We have questions about this all the time. So what about prosecution? We will we ever see Malaysia sue Indonesian companies, for example, and vice versa. What's the best litigation strategy ASEAN members can deploy or is it even an option? Uh, yeah, I'm not the law expert, but from my understanding, uh, <laughs> last year, uh, Malaysia, the Ministry of uh, Science, Technology uh, and Innovation, MaxTech, said that it would send a uh, diplomatic notes to Indo Indonesia. So immediate actions will be taken right. to put up the fire and prevent uh, repeated earnings. Uh, the other thing that we can explore is not just like, uh, not just like saying that like Malaysians want to sue Indonesia. Uh, we, we can, the other thing that we explore is like, uh, again, I say this is a, uh, global problem is also the problem uh, the cost by Malaysia company that cause deforestations in, in in Indonesia so the opportunity that we can explore is probably like suing organized people suing for help justice or the rights to clean air this is a proposal where right. uh, the Malaysians can initiate uh, lawsuits against the Malaysian company that cause fire in Indonesia and if possible push uh, push for a legally binding perpetual commitments to prevent future forest fire. So our narrative, this is very important. Our narratives uh, uh, was to telling the Indonesians has a duty to protect Southeast Asian country, including Indonesia as well. Because uh, Indonesia as a big country, they have a duty, uh, I mean, uh, which has been breached and has caused harm to its own citizens and also Southeast Asia. But we can also organize uh, people, citizens to say that, hey, 
this is not just an Indonesian problem, it's also Malaysian's problem yeah. because our peoples, our company are causing problems there. We are also exploiting the worker there. So like organizing the citizens, the victims to sue Malaysian company based in Indonesia, it could be easier to hold a Malaysian company accountable and also to uh, avoid the issue of nationalism. So the narrative should be focused mm. on on the regional efforts instead of just saying that this is a Malaysia problem or Indonesia problems. That's absolutely awesome. Interesting. Hey, citizens um, suing companies. And I know like we, we don't want to go down that path and it's never been a popular path, but I see in the future, um, this is something that might hurt companies the most. It's uh, exactly as you said, we don't want to boycott palm oil because we use them all the time but we just want to pressure companies to do better. And if that pressure comes also from their um, supply, um, as in their demand uh, from overseas in terms of their supply chains, cleaning up the supply chains and that, you know, so be it. And um, obviously they understand that this is going to definitely hit the triple bottom line. Um, I want to um, quickly go into some of the uh, questions we have from our viewers. Thank you so much everyone for uh, tuning in. We do have another, um, about 20 minutes, so sorry, about 20 minutes uh, on this one. And I have a question here uh, and it would, uh, I probably, just bear with me. So sorry, <laughs> I've got a bit, <laughs> okay. Okay, so the first question is, um, there's been a lot of change in government in Malaysia lately. Uh, how does that pose challenges for civil society organizations to pressure the government when we are dealing with such a moving target? So obviously Hayes and political and climate and environmental action is also interlaced in, in all of, uh, you know, government changes. Um, who wants to take this question? Is it Heng? Yeah, I can take first. Yeah, uh, okay. thanks for the, yeah, thanks for these questions. Yeah, it's also a challenge for us uh, as uh, NGOs. Yeah, because we have to mm. talk to many policy makers because after the change of government, we have to restart our, our political lobby. Uh, yeah, it requires lots of efforts, but we, we won't uh, just focus on Malaysia and Indonesia only. Like uh, what I mentioned uh, previously, we also tackle the supply chain, uh, the supply chain problems. Uh, for example, we have released a few reports to expose the commitments by global fast-moving consumer goods uh, regarding their commitments on NTPE, regarding their uh, commitments on uh, the protecting environments, protecting rainforests. So this is the way that we can, uh, we can explore and we will continue to pressure to monitor through the supply chain. Uh, to, uh, through the supply chain. So uh, I would say the one, emphasize the one uh, the, the keywords, uh, which is the, the next winner. Um, the next winner should be the, the company or the businesses who are most responsive to the sustainable development, who are most adaptive to the current markets. So this is the way that we can explore. So of course, if we have a better government, I mean, who are pro to environments, so that one is easier. But we can, we won't, we won't, uh, we won't just stop at government's level, we, but we will move to other uh, monitoring uh, global fast moving consumers goods company. Great, thanks, Heng. Um, and that question was from Helena, actually, one of our academics here that is uh, uh, a bit of an expert on Hayes, I see. Um, the uh, next question, I might. Uh, Can I ask you that particular question yeah. from the community? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, Nadia. So sorry. No worries. Um, so I think the the uh, from from the community's perspective, I think most of us. Uh, I can only speak from the youth perspective. Um, for the past um, few months or so, uh, we had a double whammy. We have a COVID nineteen situation, and we also have the change of government. So most of uh, the groups in Southeast Asia that Fami has been working on uh, are groups that organize strikes, groups that organize uh, uh, community mobilizations to go on the streets to to ask for better, uh, you know. Um, access to information, etc. But um, now with the COVID-19 situation, we can't even go down to the streets. We can't even rally the people because um, 
of the whole safety situation. And with in Malaysia, we we have the change of government where we don't see any kind of you know a, a response uh, or, or any kind of um, uh, kenyataan daripada you know our our politicians or, or the, the the ministers right now. And that is very um, um, uh, is very critical right now actually because this year was supposed to be the year where the the some issues some um, uh, the transboundary haze act uh, the the national adaptation plan uh, climate change act policy is supposed to be right. tabled in the parliament but that's not being done because that is, yeah they are using the covid nineteen some sort of like a, you know a pretext of not going not having to discuss about this at all so um, this is um, a quite um, you know a concerning uh, a trend not only in an environmental perspective but also in the human rights you know and the it 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 kind of um, somehow po the the political uh, COVID nineteen is being used as a uh, vehicle uh, for for you know for for parliament uh, you know the the government not. Um, following the, the the democratic principles of this country, so some most of mm. the, the monies, the the stimulus packages are all being given out without any consultation, uh, you know, from the people. So that is very problematic from us as the people working on the ground as CSOs. And um, in regards to what we can do at, um, with the regional uh, partners is basically we need to reach out to them. I think. Um, as a, a young organization, um, Kami has uh, reached out to different kinds of, uh, um, you know, youth organizations, uh, particularly in Kalimantan, um, uh, because we wanted to know what's right. going on actually over there on the ground. How are people coping? Because, mm. you know, I, I think for youth, we have been so internalized with this haze. Yeah, we don't really see it as a problem. We just kind of like, you know, oh, haze, hey, okay, datang, but nanti dah tak ada dah lagi. You know, it's like very seasonal. We don't really, you know, talk about it much, only when it's happening. And we kind of blame, you know, Indonesians all the time. You know, the kind of sentiments that we've been seeing, you know, in social media about this is very dangerous particularly because Malaysians are not informed about the situations, about the history behind haze. So what Kami has been trying to do is to uh, educate, you know, the people in Malaysia about what, what is actually happening on the ground. Are the Indonesians happy, you know, um, about, you know, um, choking haze every year? They are not. People die, you mm -hmm. know, there are premature deaths every year. And this happens not in the space of, you know, um, you know, um, five years or so it happens for decades it's it's uh, it's, uh, it's it's definitely it's partly a, a byproduct of bad governance bad enforcement um you know by the previous you know uh, indonesian uh, how do i say uh, 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 governments uh, because of this and the people are bearing bearing all the uh, the mm. side effects and uh, we have to understand the the psychological effects of this as well i mean it's it's massive, you know. You, we can't just blame a particular people, you know. Uh, just like that, you have to understand the reasoning behind it. So this is what I think. What you know, the 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 communities. I mean, what we are doing. I mean, Kami at least is doing is to reach out to these groups, give solidarity, solidarity, give them a space to speak up. You know, give them help. You know, uh, amplify the issue to the outside. You know, so people don't really you know understood what what's been happening. Partly because no one is reaching out to these groups. I mean, I really hope in the next few sessions we would have, you know, uh, um, organizations from Indonesia to speak on Chira and give their sense of their, their perspective and what, what's been happening. I think uh, it's, it will be a really eye-opening, you know, kind of discussion. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Nadia. So, uh, no, no, that's awesome. Like, I can hear this sort of, you know, tension in your voice because, you know, uh, I think you're younger than me, but we are from the same generation. And so we are left with like this shit storm, I mind my French, um, to deal with. And there is nothing wrong with pressuring businesses. We've been doing this a long time, by the way, to do better. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And so I love what you guys both are doing. Uh, we're almost running out of time, but so we might just for our viewers, we might be five minutes overdue because we actually have a little poll um, after we finish with the questions today, just to ask our viewers, what do they want to hear? Um, Chira and Kami and Greenpeace and our um, um, organization sort of collaborators to focus on in the next webinars. I know for a fact 
that we will have other people, for example, our NGO reps from Indonesia who can speak with us. So stay tuned for that one. And I know as a matter of fact as well, Greenpeace has uh, a bit more uh, information. Uh, he might, he, Heng might come back for another webinar with us to specifically talk about sustainable palm oil. But before we get into that, just so everyone's aware, I wanted to keep everyone on time. Okay, I've got two more questions, but uh, maybe this one question again, you've already answered them, Nadia, but this is from a, a community member who asks, um, many companies, especially large ones, always claim that the fires on their concessions are not started by them, but instead started from the outside, from communities, etc. And we know that there's a half truth in this one because their practices may have dried out the land anyway. So then like you might have an adjoining land and you want to plant your own, whatever it is, you want to do your own thing and then making small community plantations dangerous, you, you know, because it's not like you can, you can like divide soil. Okay, this is mine, this is yours and all that kind of stuff because it's the same soil profile. So is there a way, maybe Hank can answer this one, that we can be more forthcoming of their indirect i guess not really indirect we talked about that you know supply chain the third level um forthcoming of the responsibilities of these buyers um and well said nadia and and again and then i'll go back to nadia to see if there is any work on the ground to help communities uh use fire uh practices uh, as in safer fire practices so uh that's from a question from a member um uh whoa his name him or her i'm so sorry uh so that was it's there somewhere so hang i'll start with you and then nadia maybe you can finish this one up okay yeah uh in reality the economic benefits of this uh, palm oil booms act actually uh, have fallen into a handful of already wealthy indi uh, individuals or corporations that control the big plantations uh or this company um, so uh, what we can see, like by contrast, many of these costs has been borne by the uh, look, uh, worker and community. So sometimes I can see like some company is just blaming that, oh, it's actually not our problem, but it's the local community problem. Mm -hmm. I, for me, I think that the company shouldn't put it as an excuse because they are the person who like maximize the profit, who get most of the profit. Instead, they should support, uh, give more support to the local community uh, to solve the so uh, social conflict between local people and the plantations company uh, because uh, this is a way that we need to work on because uh, uh, palm oil can be grown uh, responsibly without destroying forests and local people uh, shouldn't have to lose their livelihoods because uh, uh, what I can see right now the glo globally uh, like the richest 1% in the world actually are exploiting the natural resources and let the 99% of the poor people to bear the consequences, which is not fair. So we need the uh, company, we need more responsible company to take a stand, to provide more support, to provide more technology uh, and, and a possible financial support to build out the lo local community. This is a su 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 sustainable de development that we need to look at it in the future. Great, okay. Nadia, is there anything we've done on the ground to kind of help communities? Well, um, this is actually a, a, a really complex question, really, because um, uh, if I want to say uh, uh, Kalimantan as a case study, um, most of the Dayak people, who's the original people living on that particular area that was being, you know, pushed aside uh, to, mm -hmm. to make uh, this, this really huge uh, mega uh, food estates uh, projects, um, they, 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 they simply were... were uh, and there was also a transmigration, you know, from, from Java, all these transmigrants that settled down, they were invited by the, 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 the Suharto re uh, can't say regime, the Suharto government to come to Kalimantan to start over, to help out with the, with the uh, conversion and everything. And um, when the activity didn't manage, when the project didn't manage to pan out and, and it was a failure, so some of the people, they still stay there. You know, in, in Kalimantan, they mm -hmm. did not go back to Java. So um, these are the, the communities that has uh, that do not have the kind of uh, expertise the Dayak people have in terms of uh, fire pre prevention, uh, using fire sustainably. So um, there's 
I think because of this, there's also a tension between these two, you know, communities as well. Meaning that the Dayak people that has been forced out from their from their lands have the knowledge, and the the current people that is occupied occupy, uh, occupying that land do not have the kind of uh, you know uh, uh, um, customary knowledge about using fires and and how you know uh, um, especially in pit as uh, pit swamp forest. So I think that should be. I think uh, this is not my 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 opinion lah. I think most of the groups in Kalimantan ha ha has tried to to um, connect back you know the the people. Uh, I mean these two communities together and learn from each other. You know and and for for the communities to um, to to unite as one and help each other in terms of uh, you know uh, um, 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 sharing knowledge, sharing best practices, etc. I think this this particular area has not been spoken much about how how um, you know uh, people that has been um, had, had that has settled in in Kalimantan and they they do not have anything except for their land i mean these are the people from jawa again so and then they they do not have any money the project basically failed mm. so the the cheapest way for them to do is to burn and slash and and you know mm. results in in this kind of activities whereas the daya they don't even burn in peat swamp they don't even convert peat you know, they only burn uh, soil, di different kind of soils. So these are the kind of informations that we, you know, uh, policymakers or people outside Indonesia should know. You know, uh, we, we can't just blame the committee. This is the kind of stereotype that's being, you know, uh, forced down to us by, by corporations and etc. That, that small plantation holders are responsible for this. But in, in uh, actuality, this this particular question is, is very complex. You have to solve the, you know, the upstream yeah. issue before you can solve the downstream issue, right? So um, I think in to answer that question, there should definitely be more, you know, uh, a, a engagement with these uh, two communities together. You know, teaching each other and and heal whatever yeah, the heal the, the the past kind of conflicts that they have been facing because this is a very, um, you know, um, complex and and uh, and how do I say it, it it draws blood you know the the conflict draws blood you know it's a kejadian berdarah tau so um, mm -hmm. people died because of this so we need to heal that you know especially on that and so, indigenous knowledge should definitely be incorporated in forest fire management definitely as we have seen in Australia it should be seen in, in Kalimantan as well yeah Thank you so much, Nadia. I really love that perspective. So I just want to wrap up this one quickly. We've got um, thank you to um, Helena again for that question, but it was kind of like a mixed question. I put the two together with a community member, Prayoto Tonoto. So thank you. Um, I'm sorry if I said that wrong. So I just want to uh, finish one question and then we'll do a poll. Uh, we have a live stream here and we're going to do a poll. And I don't know if you guys have done this before, but just let me just finish this off. Heidi Wagner um, actually asked, how do we tactfully get people to avoid products with um, palm oil and activities that cause forest destruction? And uh, because she said people don't want to be told about it. They love their products and love shopping so much. So that is a, <laughs> that is an interesting question. I think um, what we can do as communities, I think I covered this in uh, our interview at BFM Business Radio on Thursday, which is we can support sustainable uh, palm oil products and you can look for certain certifications on the shelf, which is RSPO or CSPO, as Hang already mentioned earlier. But let, let me be clear, um, again, in the context of environmental consumerism and environmental activism, it is still very low in terms of infiltration to the community in Malaysia. So um, I think that what you say about environmental democracy, and uh, 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 Nadia, is actually pertinent here in that question. It reflects I think the decisions we make as citizens reflect also our awareness as citizens. As, as citizens. So I think if we don't, um, we don't equip ourselves with that awareness and that knowledge, then who, who are we to kind of enact action, you know, at government compliance and also business level. Um, just to finish off, um, I have a feeling we will have hang back. So you guys, um, please stay tuned for some updates from Chura. We have a topic with Hank coming back to talk about haze and sustainable palm oil. Is it possible?
possible. So that's our one of our next webinar questions. Um, and now we'll go to, and I'll put that in the comments later. I think one of our admins are putting that in the comments later. So stay tuned for that one. Thank you, Hang. Uh, we can talk about sustainable palm oil and pulp and paper plantations management further um, in a more in a more detailed um, webinar. So let's go to the poll. Um, you will see a QR code in front of your uh, screen right uh, soon. Um, we have two questions to ask people. The question number one is, which, uh, which direction should the in-depth discussion be in the future webinar? So the question is, um, so what kind of topics do you guys want us to see cover in future webinars? What topics do you guys want us to cover in future webinars? There's, there's about four answers. They weather analysis, land use, um, fire analysis, laws and regulations analysis, and international cooperation analysis. So um, I'll give everyone about one minute to, um, to participate in the poll. Just uh, if you have a QR code scanner in your phone, you should be able to just scan that and the questions will come up. Okay, let's go to, do you want to have the results up here? Great. Oh, okay, sorry, I asked the wrong question. <laughs> That's okay. Would you like to see, who would you like to see as a panelist in future webinars? Um, we have a few, a bit more votes from government representative. That's interesting, we put government on the spot. <laughs> Wouldn't you love that? Okay, great, thank you, we've got, a few, uh, the maximum amount of votes for that, and then palm oil rep, and then NGO rep. So we will try and get someone from government on this webinar if we can. Next question. We have another poll, I believe. Thank you, Aro. This is the right question, yes. The first question was, who do you want to see come up in a webinar? Who do you want us to interview? And then the second question is, which, um, which uh, topic would you like us to see cover in the future? There's four, you can, yeah, there's four there. Weather analysis, land and fire use analysis, laws and regulations analysis, and international cooperation. Okay, so international cooperation wins this poll this time. So we just wanted to gauge who our viewers are and what you guys are interested in. So thank you so much for that. The poll is now finished, but we will put the poll up um, to the non-participants of today's webinar um, in the Chura page. So we should be able to collate some of that uh, information. So we're already four minutes out of time. Uh, so I wanted to just quickly, uh, if we can get off this poll, I just want to quickly uh, say thank you to Nadia and Hang. Do you guys have any last words in terms of environmental activism and how you can get involved? Okay, uh, maybe I start first. Okay, uh, we are now uh, living in the climate emergencies. What we have seen uh, right now uh, is the impacts of this uh, in this uh, climate. The haze crisis is not about the EU or Malaysia or Indonesia. It's about our planet. Even worse that uh, the country like Malaysia and Indonesia are considered as a, a vulnerable uh, from climate change. Therefore, uh, this political crash, uh, the clash should be seen by government and also the industry as a new beginning to evaluate the way we produce our commodity that not destroying forests and start to protect and restore our forests as this is the easiest way and cheapest way to save our planet. And this uh, COVID-19 pandemic give us a wake up call. We can't afford to have another crisis anymore. So to take these actions, mm -hmm. we have to write, to draw, to paint, to design, to strike, to protest, leaflets, whatever works, join NGOs, join Chara, join GAMI, uh, join like environmental NGO Greenpeace, do something. Because we want to tell to the uh, corporations that we have people, people's power is the core success of all these uh, campaigns. Thank you. Thanks, Nadia. 
Well, well said, Hang. You you practically mentioned everything <laughs> that I wanted to say. But well, I I just uh, want want to add a, a bit on that uh, in terms of uh, youth participation. Come on, guys. <laughs> Please, we we, have, we we seriously have to do it. I mean, like I know I, I'm like possibly trying to you know give out like uh, this thing like. We, I know that we are facing a lot, you know, or with unemployment, with the COVID-19 situation, but we cannot afford to not do anything. You know, we, we have to use whichever channels that we can, top, bottom, bottom up. But in effectuality, please, let's work together. Let's, you know, sit together. Um, you don't have to play, you know, a hero or something like that. We, we are all in this together. I, I'm really hoping that youth would, would, would step up you know, and, and, and uh, you know, communicate and engage more with each other rather than working in silo, working in, in their own little bubble. We have to branch out. We have to branch out. We can't just work with youth anymore. We, we have to work together with everything, with everyone. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> Awesome, 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 awesome. Yes, I feel energized and I feel <laughs> I feel um we can we can keep this momentum going. So one of the things that you guys can do is um actually uh watch uh, a recording of this webinar. So that will be up on our website, but also Kami's website on Facebook and I believe on YouTube as well. So was isn't that an absolutely enlightening and fascinating conversation with our panelists, Nadia and Hang? We can see that grassroots campaigning as well as international pressure backed by well-funded NGOs both have a role to play in the context of tackling the haze crisis and its root causes. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. I'm so pumped. Ah! <laughs> so again, we will be posting a recorded version of this webinar on our Facebook page. Don't... Um, don't, I'm so sorry if I can't answer all the questions. I know some of the questions are coming through now, but we will be posting a recorded version of this webinar on our Facebook page. If we haven't been able to answer them, your questions, we will collate them for future ones and we'll attach some of them here on this Facebook Live um, comments. Don't forget to like our Facebook page, Chura Anti Haze Action at facebook.com slash anti haze action. And if you want to follow Kami, it's facebook.com slash Klima Action. That's right. And I think Greenpeace Malaysia also has a Facebook page. So follow them and also follow us on Instagram at Chura Asia. We will continue to fight to keep our skies clear in 2020 and beyond. So this is the end of the webinar. Thank you. Sorry we went over time, but we look forward to seeing you guys at our next one. Thanks all. Yep, Thanks thank everyone. You. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, live stream ended. <laughs> okay, yeah. Shall we have the brief? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great job.